We might as well get started. Hello and welcome to the museum. I'm Frank Bond. I'm a producer here at the museum and we have a special treat today in that right here in the room we have the 2016 Feature Photography winner of the Pulitzer and that's Ms. Jessica Rinaldi here. <laughs> Jessica works at the Boston Globe, and Bill Green is the director of photography at the Boston Globe. Welcome to you both. Thank you. Thank you. You know, what we have here is an extraordinary story. Of course, winning the Pulitzer would tell you that. But it's an, an intimate story, uh, and it's an important story. Uh, don't be fooled by the name feature. And so, Jessica, start us off. Um, tell us a little bit about Strider Wolf and, and how you got this assignment. Um. So our, our features reporter, Sarah Schweitzer, had been looking through court documents and she found this story, um, she found an appeal that was written by Strider's abuser and that made her sort of want to look into the story a little bit more, but um, when Bill first called and told me about the story, he said that it was um, going to be a story about a little boy and a horse. We thought it was going to be this uplifting story about a little boy who had sort of been abused but was working past it and uh, a horse that had also been abused and the two kind of came together and uh, were healing each other. And that sounded awesome and I thought, oh, this is great. We're going up for a very uplifting, happy story. And it did not turn out that way. <laughs> Bill, in the final analysis, why is this story an important story for the Boston Globe and its readers? I think it's great to see, um, you know, so much of significant work is done jet setting off to the biggest disasters of the world. And to see a homegrown enterprise story in a, in a newspaper's backyard, I mean, it's incredibly powerful work, obviously, but it, it, in, it, in its nature, it seems like a, it's a quiet story. And to see a quiet story um, get the attention of winning a Pulitzer Prize is very rewarding for all of us. And, on an important subject. So, Jessica, you worked four months in the field, got very close to this family, uh, and, and we're talking about a family where that in Strider's past there was abuse. Mm -hmm. Now he was being raised by his grandparents, but the trouble had not ended because they had a, a lot to, to, to overcome in their lives. Right, yeah. So the, um, the family had become homeless in the course of the story, and. So they were packing up the boys and they just told them they were going camping and they put them into a camper and they spent the summer bouncing between campgrounds uh, back and forth and, and they were evicted from uh, the trailer that they were living in and that was very dramatic, sorry. And uh, they weren't allowed to kind of take all of their things, they just ran out of time. So it was, um, we spent a lot of time with them just sort of documenting what they were going through. How do you get the kind of access? Because you live closely with this family for, for four months. How does that develop over time so that you and your reporter can be in their lives and yet be at a distance enough to document what's going on? I think a lot of it is just done by being there, by going when you say, you know, you say you're going to go and um, listening to people. You just sort of develop relationships. You talk and... Um, and over time, they just sort of accept you. They accept the fact that you're going to be there. And it's not like you, you go on the first day and you say, I'm going to be here now for four months. Mm -hmm. um, you sort of go and, uh, and then you come back and you keep coming back. And at a certain point, you say, you know, we'd really like to invest a lot of time in this story and really tell it properly. And I think that they appreciated that. And that was part of what ha helped. But I, I'd, I'd like to add that uh, Jess is underselling herself. There's a certain skill set is needed to become invisible, a fly on the wall, and it takes tremendous patience, tremendous empathy, and um, not everyone has that skill set, and just really can do that very well with the best of them. And this comes along, this story, and this storytelling using photography much uh, more upfront, uh, really enhanced by, number one, your online version of the Boston Globe, but tell me how much space was dedicated to it, even in, in the newsprint version. Um, we've been, since John Henry bought the Globe, we've had been very generous with space. Uh, major projects, including this one, often the starting off point is four clear pages, um, starting on page one on Sunday. Um, 
and in those four clear pages, 50% of the, the display will be photographs. Um, so it's a really wonderful balance. As a reader's turning the pages, they're not feeling overwhelmed with, with type. Um, this might have been five, I think it was five. five pages, yeah. Mm -hmm. But we take it depending on the content. We try to, you know, even in this economy, we try to say this, this deserves this, and this story deserved as much space as we could give it. Jessica, how would you describe Strider Wolf, the, this little boy that you got to know pretty well over that four month period? Oh, Strider is such a sweet little boy. Um, you know, he's really resilient, and I think that was the thing that we immediately saw in him, that he was special. You know, he had been through something really horrific, uh, but he sort of had this way about him where he could just kind of like zone everything out and still be a kid, still manage to kind of focus, and um, he'd just go off into the woods and play, and, and you could sort of see he could just leave it all behind, which was really great. When we get to the first image in here, I'm going to ask my crew if they can just freeze it for a while because that's the first one I want you uh, to talk about. And, and in that little boy and his resiliency, you saw a story that is universal in appeal and, and in its message across all readers across the whole nation. What, 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 what is that message? You know, I think that there are so many kids like this, right? There are so many children who have suffered abuse. There are so many children that are living in poverty. There are many different striders out there, um, and this is just one. And I, I think, I think that that's what people saw in this story. You know, they saw him and his, and what he was going through. But I think they realized it was a little bit bigger than him too. Talk a little bit about this particular image, because uh, because this one has a special meaning for you. Yeah, this I shot um, actually on the first day that we had gone up to meet with the family, and. Um, you know, Strider had, he had his shirt off and he was sort of playing around and I could see the scar on his belly um, from where the feeding tube had been after he had been beaten. And um, I really wanted to be able to show that. And then, you know, he and his brother started climbing on this tree and in the end that, that really became such a metaphor for, you know, how they were just continuing to climb and trying to get out of this terrible situation. And you also saw a kid that you were kind of rooting for and hoping that he could do it, you know. You can start the, the slides moving again. Uh, as we talk, the other uh, two main characters in this story are, are the grandparents. I mean, because there were stresses on them that, that you had to be in their lives for that four month period to understand and then know how to use your photography around that. Tell me about the, the stresses that they went through trying to help their grandson. So I think, you know, these were people who had not expected to become parents again. Um, they had ended up with their, their son's two children, and, um, and that wasn't something that they had necessarily seen coming, right? And um, so they... they I'm going to ask them, freeze that frame <laughs> just for a second. Thank you. Sure. Go ahead. No, so I mean, I think that they were, um, they were stretched thin, right? They were trying really hard to kind of figure out this situation, and, and uh, on top of that, they had these two little kids. So. That kind of made for tension here and there. And as a result, these two kids were living a life that, that started with the very, very basics as depicted in this picture, which you have to listen to Jessica talk about it to understand what you're looking at. Yeah, so, um, you know, there, in, in the course of shooting this story, I was really trying to figure out how do I talk about how, what the conditions are that they're living under. and. Um, I shot a lot inside the camper, trying to show that they were really crammed into this little place. But in the end, I feel like this photo of Strider carrying these jugs of water, he's gone to the back of the trailer and filled up the water to bring it around to his grandmother so that she could bathe him and, um, and do the dishes. And I feel like that small moment, and also he looks like such an old soul in this picture. Um, and you know, that for me says so much more about how they were living and the conditions they were living under than probably any other photo I shot. Bill, how did the reading public, and you can start the slides again, how did the reading public respond to this story once it was in the Globe? Uh, we had a tremendous response. Um, I, they, uh, there was an outpouring of people that wanted to help. Um, a trust fund was set up for Strider and his family. Um, a lot of people donated. So there were some significant uh, resources were donated to the family. And Jessica, you, uh, I think it was Bill who mentioned it, the photographer 
uh, the most effective tool is the, your invisibility, when you become invisible because you get to know the people and they get to be used to you around. But you also have to stand back and document and you're not there to solve their problems. Right. You're there to document their problems. How difficult is that? Oh, it's really difficult. As a human being, you kind of want to be the person that's you want to help, right? And instead, sometimes you feel like a terrible monster for just taking photos. But um, in the end, you have to really believe in this work and believe that what you're doing is going to shine a light and somehow help eventually. We can freeze this image. And uh, this is one that has special meaning for you also, as I understand. Yeah, um, you know, so this, is, this image is Gallagher, Strider's little brother, sitting in the dirt at the campground. And Strider has just drawn these circles around him. And, and um, you know, there were days when this story just felt so sad and just so mired in sadness. And so for me, that's, that was how I was feeling the day I shot this photo. You know, he's just drawing these rings around him and it feels like he's sinking deeper and deeper and it's just never going to get better. And it was also on this day that we found out that um, the family's food stamps had been cut by $100 because they didn't have a house payment anymore. Um, so it's just sort of like the injustice of all of that kind of, uh, for me, and, and that might just be a personal photographer thing, but I connect that to that image. And you can roll the slides again. It, Tell us about the, the impact on you as, as, as a photographer, but, but also, you know, just as a woman watching this, living through this for that period of time. Um, you know, stories like this are very sad and they're hard to do. I mean, it's just nobody wants to see a child or children living in these conditions. Nobody wants to see a family going through this stuff. Um, you know, I think every story that you do like this, it takes it takes a little something, you know? You leave a little something on the table because you have to you have to give it your entire being and you have to open up your heart. And how did it feel for you to see the response from the reading public? Oh, it was tremendous. I mean, that was the best part of this, you know? To that was I mean, the the Pulitzer is obviously a tremendous <laughs> achievement and and honor, but the way that they responded was really the best part of this story for me. I mean, the fact that people opened up their, they just opened up their hearts to help this family. That was great. How did you find out you had won the Pulitzer? Mr. Bill Green called me. <laughs> uh, I, was, I was in Atlanta and I was covering the Celtics. Um, I was not thinking about the Pulitzer at all. And I was just driving and he called and he was like, Jess, I, I think you won the Pulitzer. And I was like, what are you talking about? <laughs> and, uh, he said, no, no, I really, I really think you did. And I, I had to pull over. I was like, what story? I just didn't, I didn't believe it. So I spent about two hours sitting on a stone wall. <laughs> Bill, you must have thought about that phone call before you made it. Well, it was really interesting. In the old days, people in the industry, there would be leaks and you sort of had an idea the day before if you'd won and we hadn't heard anything. And uh, we had sort of, not given up hope, but we had sort of figured out it's not meant to be. And then I'm watching the computer, the live feed, and uh, I saw them say, you know, and in feature photography, a uh, story about a boy. And I'm like, yes. And they said a story about an abused boy. And then they said Jessica's name and hmm. the whole newsroom went crazy. But we had no idea what was gonna happen. Freeze this one because uh, at, at the end of the day, um, Strider and his family are no longer homeless. Tell me about this image. Yeah, so we didn't know. You know, when you're in the midst of these stories, you don't know where they're going to go. And um, when you see the final product, I think it's really easy to go, okay, that has like a beginning, a middle end. It totally makes sense. But when you're in it, you just never know. And um, so when they finally did find a home, we kind of knew that that would be the natural end of our story. Um, but you know, I was there in the morning when the boys first woke up in their, their new home and, and we liked that picture but we thought that this actually was sort of a less predictable, more interesting way to kind of end it because here you have Strider and instead of the woods where he's been now he's in this sort of fenced in backyard and it feels safe and, um, and you can see the house back there and he's got this robe on but it almost looks like a cape, like some people have told me they see a superhero in this, which I love. And um, so yeah, we just thought that this would be sort of a, an optimistic note to leave this story on. I think we have a microphone out here because we want to take some questions from you. And if you tell us who you are and where you're from and then go ahead and ask away. 
And if we have someone, we can get started. In the meantime, while you're warming up the nerve to take the <laughs> microphone. <laughs> <laughs> oh, we've got somebody who's going to take the leap. Hello. Hi, I'm Robin Klein. I'm a nurse at Joe DiMaggio Children's Hospital in Hollywood, Florida. What um, was going on with the children's education? I'm kind of thinking, you know, there's a mandate to send them to school. And, and well, through this, was that going on? And yeah, they were still in school. Um, there was a really sad point in the story where Strider had like a panic attack about which bus to take home because it kept changing. Um, but yeah, they were in school throughout the, the majority of the story. And we actually went to school um, to photograph and, and report from there. Um, and that was actually sort of this heartbreaking day because, um, it, you know, it, they were doing like a PTA grab bag fundraiser thing. And for a dollar, you could get a bag with some pencils in it. And we showed up and Strider said, did my mom give you the, you know, he called Lynette his mom. And did my mom give you the dollar? And we said no. And he just like crawled into this little corner and kind of sunk into himself. And man, at that point, I just wanted to like pull all the money out of my pocket and give it to him, but you can't do it, so. Mm -hmm. Thanks for your question. And when we go back, um, how much, did you know anything about this world before you had this assignment? Had, had, had you seen it? Had you spent any time in it? Had you imagined it? I suppose to some extent, but certainly not, um, you know, like this. Mm -hmm. I mm -hmm. mean, this, this part of Maine is kind of interesting because um, it's, uh, there are a lot of vacation homes there and it's like a place where you don't quite expect this amount of rural poverty. Mm -hmm. I think I had done poverty in the city, um, but to see it out here on these terms, people bouncing between campgrounds, that was a totally new thing. Go into the abyss for another question. We can't see you up here because of All the right. light, so just go ahead and start <laughs> talking. My name is Toby Yunus. I'm a documentary maker from Santa Fe, New Mexico. And I feel like a 20, the 24-hour news cycle has had a negative impact on print journalism, but more especially on long-term uh, photo features like yours. Um, how do you plan to help overcome that or make the impact that you feel like you need to make uh, when you're going through this uh, effort? We'll start with Bill. Um, well, I agree with you. It's, it's very sad what's going on in the newspaper industry. Uh, most newspapers, I can speak for photo departments, have lost half their staff and they're just, everything's shrinking, constricting, people are mired into chasing the daily news and getting, filling the paper. Um, we are very fortunate at the Globe um, to have still a relatively full roster of incredibly talented people and my mandate to all of them is best idea wins, whoever's got a story, you go do it and we will all cover for you while you're gone. Uh, right now we have another photographer on the staff who is working on a heroin story and so you know my commitment, what I cut my teeth on was documentary, social, important, you know, stories and we will, I will never allow that to go by the wayside. We'll always be able to pursue them at the newspaper. But it's a luxury, there's no question. For most staffs, they just don't have, have the manpower to pull it off. How much of it has to do with, with your, your readership, your, your circulation, your, you're up in the Boston area, uh, education level's high, income level's high. How much, uh, as a newspaper, do you rely on your readership really appreciating what a newspaper brings to life? Well, it's really interesting. We just did a, uh, a survey, a reader survey on what people wanted and appreciated the most in the newspaper. And ranked in the top five out of 100 objects, items where it was uh, long form documentary storytelling, um, which shocked me a little bit. Um, but uh, the people, people love it. The engagement time in these stories is uh, tremendous, and people really want to see this. And, and for a newspaper, that would mean buying the paper Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, or, or something special on Sunday. Or buying it online, often. Or buying yeah. it online. Okay, good, good. Thank you for your question. We get another question? Yeah. Um, hi, I'm Eileen from Chicago, Illinois. Um, I uh, am a freelance photojournalist, and I'm kind of just getting into photojournalism. I studied it in school, but I was wondering if you have any advice on how to kind of break in um, into the field. I know obviously it's, <laughs> everyone's like, this is the worst time to pick this profession, but I love it so much. So I was just wondering if you had any 
Well, so what I would say about this is the worst time to pick this profession. <laughs> when I graduated uh, in 2001, everybody said, this is the worst time. <laughs> you should not become a photographer. You know, newspapers are dying. And I've always had work. Um, so I, I think just go for it. And, you know, the best, um, the best thing that I was able to do was to, to get internships when I was still in school and then meet photographers that way. And um, you know, the community is really small and we all kind of know each other and we're all pretty supportive and helpful for the most part. And um, so I think that, you know, do it that way and, and then start freelancing and talk to editors and show your work and just don't be afraid to, don't listen to what everybody else is saying because we need storytellers, we really do. It's very important. You wanna add anything to that, Bill? Well, you know, I, I guess you could argue that the good news of shrinking staffs is gonna be, you know, um, papers and agencies relying on more freelancers. It costs less money to hire a freelancer than it does to pay health insurance to a staff. So, you know, maybe that's the other, the bright <laughs> side of it. Thanks for your question. You have another question? Hi, I'm Bridget. I'm an intern here. Mm -hmm. um, and I hope to be a journalist one day too. And I was wondering, so you talked a little bit about the sadness that you felt covering the story. How did you deal with that? Because that's something that I'm most afraid of if I ever become a journalist. Oh, don't be afraid of the sadness. No, um, <laughs> you know, I think that um, you kind of, first of all, you have to talk to people, right? You have to like talk about it, I think, because if you bottle it all up, that will just, it will eat you alive. So. I'm very lucky. I have a husband who will actually listen to me. He's not a journalist. <laughs> um, he, he lives these things secondhand. And, um, and so I have that. You know, I, I go running. I mean, you find like a healthy outlet. You find an unhealthy outlet. You sort of balance them out. <laughs> um, <laughs> you do what you got to do, you know. But it is something you have to deal with. I yeah. mean, there is an emotional component if you're getting close enough to tell the story in a way that it means something to the reader or the viewer. Definitely. Thank you. Let, let's go again. Hello. Hi. Uh, Kim from Arlington, Virginia. Um, in the beginning, you had spoken about how the story was supposed to be with about a boy and a horse. And obviously, the outcome was much different, and I applaud it. It's amazing. But um, how did you make that artistic transition? Oh, well, it was pretty easy because uh, Strider had no connection with the horse. So I called Bill and I was like, this is not going to be about a boy and a horse. Uh, and then the, the horse is actually very sadly got taken away in the course of the story. So that decision was sort of made for me on many levels. But that's another aspect of being a photographer also. I mean, you, you can leave your newsroom with an expectation of what you're going to find. Right. And quite often what you find is something else altogether or what develops is yeah. something else altogether. And you've got to be disciplined enough to cover what happened, not what you thought was going to happen. That's and also a good lesson in not preconceiving. Right. Oftentimes, the story will morph into something that's different or better if you just keep your eyes open to it. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Good, good. Hello. Hi, I'm Peter from Toledo, Oregon. And I'm interested in knowing about the photos that you loved that your editors didn't choose. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, <laughs> We're going to stop, stop taping right now. <laughs> so we'll have a talk later. <laughs> no, it's funny you say that, actually, because, um, you know, I think that there's a very important part of this process, which is, at a certain point, bringing other people in. To, it's why I wanted Bill here today, because none of this stuff is done by just one person. You know, this, this was such a joint endeavor. First of all, the writer and I, right, we worked hand in hand on this whole thing, and um, and then in the end, I had a hundred photos that I was pretty married to, right? And, right. Um, and we threw them down, and there was one that I really loved that did not make the cut. And <laughs> The group talked her out of it. Everyone in the group was like, no, it's just not it. This isn't it. And I, at that point, you have to defer to them because you get so emotionally invested, and you're so close to the story that sometimes you just can't see it. You want it's, to... It's yeah, I mean, it, I, my approach to the whole editing process was, to me, it's very personal. You, you always defer, if you can, to the photographer. And Jess and I, as we worked, she worked on this project, we kept looking at it and winnowing it down. But I'll tell you, the, the eyeballs at the Globe are pretty extraordinary. Two-time winner, Pulitzer winner, Stan Grossfeld. Two-time Pulitzer winner, Craig Walker. Keith Bedford, Suzanne Kreider. I mean, the list goes on and on. And when you lay 100 pictures out on the table, 
and everyone as a group starts saying, I like this one as your lead, this is the best, it, and you keep doing that over and over, it, it gets almost self-selecting. It becomes, you, not so much you're choosing them, they're choosing themselves. Um, photographers often get you know, enamored with, like, you don't know what I went through to get this photo. I, I stayed up all night and was like, that's great, but it's not that good. <laughs> <laughs> so it really is important to have, when I was a photographer, you were I constantly craving outside edits. Um, but at the end of the day, you have to make, this, I don't think there was, there was one photo you liked that no one else was crazy about. No but for the most part, yeah. I think everyone was on the same page. <laughs> it's a real collaborative effort. Oh, it was a photo of um, Strider hanging upside down on a swing set. I don't know. It's a, it, I can't describe it in a way that would make, I'll send it to you later. <laughs> <laughs> you had to be there. <laughs> Great question. Thank you. We have another question out here? Yep. I'm Akiva Dean Strider from Alexandria, Virginia. I was wondering what happened to the parents because he just gets abused and then it's to the grandparents. So yeah, so Strider was actually abused by his mother's boyfriend, right? So the boyfriend is in jail. The mother is now kind of out of the picture. Um, his biological father still is sort of in the picture and comes. He just um, isn't really equipped to kind of handle two boys. Um, so he's still in their lives. Is that a good way to, yeah. to talk about it, to explain it? He's still there. And, um, and, and I think he's like, he's sort of taken on the role of a bigger brother. And the mom is just, she's kind of out of the picture, gone. Okay, thank you. Over here we have a question. Yes. Congratulations, first of all. Thank you. What an honor. Thank you. And because of that, I mean, the Pulitzer Prize, I mean, that's the top, top notch. <laughs> so how are you I'm going to- I'm just as surprised as you are. <laughs> and I, I totally understand. But how do you take the fact that you've now a Pulitzer Prize winning photographer and not do some self-competing with yourself to maybe try to make the next Pulitzer Prize photo? <laughs> Um, well, I'm not really wired that way. I'm sort of the type of person that looks at these photos and I'm like, how did this happen? <laughs> uh, so that helps. But I think that we're all always striving for the next better story, right? But, but in the end, it's not about winning awards. Nobody does this work to win awards. We do this work because it really matters. And, um, you know, if you can, you can tell a story like this one and sort of shine a light and get people to understand it a little bit. Um, I think that goes a really long way. When I came in this morning, I found Bill and Jessica in the booth watching the, the Pulitzer movie. Is there or are there a few images in that Pulitzer pantheon that, that are really special to you, either both of you one at a time? That, that speak to you? Oh, sure. Yeah. Um, I mean, I think Stan's photo right there. Uh, that's always been one that's been sort of burned into my head, especially as kind of a, a, a kid that came up in Boston. You know, I always looked up to Stan Grossfeld, so to be working with him now is sort of insane. <laughs> and um, yeah, that photo has a lot of meaning for me. I think, uh, you know, basically everything John White has ever shot is like tremendously amazing because he does these sort of just everyday life, you know, kind of finding really beautiful moments. Um, sometimes for me it's the quieter photos, but yeah, Stanley Foreman's picture that, you know, there are photos in this gallery that changed, that changed a, a lot, right? That, that photo of the kids falling from the fire escapes, that changed the whole fire code and the way that we, you know, it, it made everybody safer. One still photo. I think that's incredible. Bill? Oh, there's photos that are you know, permanently burned into my hard drive. I mean, Eddie Adams' um, assassination in Saigon, Nick Utz, um, the, the napalm girl, um, you know, one photo that I'm very partial to that unfortunately didn't win a Pulitzer is John Tamaki's photos of the three cops and the runner down from the, um, the Boston Marathon bombing. You know, video is, it's often, you know, video is, seems like it's taking over a lot of things, but I would still and always argue that the still photograph is, will always be the king, the king imagery that you can't, when you see a great piece of video, and I, I'm a big fan of video, I, I did videos, but you're left with sort of a feeling, like that was a nice piece or that was a sad piece, but that still photograph just burns in your head and you can't get it out of your head. Very good, another question? 
Hi, congratulations. I'm Mike from the comeback city of Detroit, Michigan. <laughs> and I wonder, did you ever have a feeling that you or your camera in any way influenced the story? So I think that generally by being there, you feel like um, in the beginning, you have to work past that, right? That's, that's a big part of what you do. Because you get there and immediately the kids want to know what you're doing, what's up with the camera, right? So um, I always try to diffuse that by letting kids like look through the camera, take a couple of photos, and then generally the, that mystery is over. And over time they kind of forget about you, but you definitely have to be very um, conscientious of that in your editing because you know, if there's something that they're doing for you, that's not, it's not real. So you just have to be honest about that in your edit. Because sometimes it, you know, especially with children, sometimes that happens. Mm -hmm. I think we can take one last question. If we have one. Anybody else? Don't have to make one up. <laughs> <laughs> Our Vice President for Exhibits, Kathy Trost, is here in the audience. I don't know if you want to say anything to, while you're here in the, in the room. breed but they're an endangered species to some extent in the United States and across the world and it's like John Lewis the great congressman and civil rights hero once said that without journalists the civil rights movement would have been like a bird without wings and I think that's what they bring us they bear witness um, they show us what we need to know and without them uh, our democracy will be in in much more danger than it is right now so thank you all for paying attention today and bearing witness to their to their work very good thanks Kathy thank you, thank you all